Hi, uh, so my name is Tim Lillycrap, and I'm, I'm uh, here presenting on behalf of uh, the member of my group who really did most of the work. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it, um, but that's Sergei Bartonov. Um, and so yeah, he's the one who actually ran a lot of these experiments. There's some other people here who've helped me too. Uh, so I'm gonna get going. I wanna, uh, I, I've been interested in a long time uh, about this idea that the uh, that backprop might have to, uh, something to tell us about the brain. And I think recently because of what has happened with deep networks and so on, people have kind of gotten re-interested in whether deep learning uh, uh, algorithms like backprop might have us, m might tell us anything about the brain. And so this, this kind of question naturally arises, which is that do any of the existing biologically motivated algorithms that we have lying around, do any of them scale up to solve the sort of problems that have kind of convinced us uh, that, that something like backprop is useful and meaningful and important? Um, and so the, the problem that backprop solves is, is this one. It's the sort of credit assignment problem in deep, in deep layered structures, um, which, which in some sense we're faced with for sure in the brain. That is, you have to adjust um, synapses earlier on um, so that they will have the, uh, the desired effects downstream. Um, and I think, I think most of the people in this room have probably coded a, a, a backprop network at this point, um, at some point in their lives. Um, it's cosine, so hopefully I don't have to spend too much time talking about this. Um, but this is, you know, this is the state of things now. Um, backprop is really what lies behind virtually all of the state of the art, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning results that have come around in the last uh, six or seven years. Um, and, and, it, and it's really you know, about this. I mean, you basically move the directions and uh, the weights in the direction of the gradient. And that's, that's what we use to train image net networks. That's what we use to train networks that solve uh, things like Go, et cetera. So um, kind of getting back to the brain, um, I, I, I wanna say, I think it's worth saying to begin with that really is, there is this sort of big spectrum of credit assignment algorithms um, that could be going on in the brain. One of them um, really simply might be that you look at changes in your errors, just correlate that with some noise in your, your neurons or in your weights, and move in, that dire in the directions where you know, that looked good. On the other hand, things like backprop deliver these vector gradients, which are very detailedly telling, telling the network, change this network, this weight in this direction. Right? And so there's, there's a, a big spectrum in between. People have been starting to create uh, new algorithms that lie in here and might be more biologically plausible but we don't know if any of them will actually scale up to, to big stuff. Okay, so I just wanted to note very quickly, because I'm gonna suggest that this might be a good benchmark going forward for people in this community. Um, so we, we know what human uh, machine performance on something like ImageNet is. ImageNet, there's lots of problems with it, but we, it's a solid benchmark, it's been around. Um, this is what human performance looks like now. This is what um, probably good, uh, good network looks like nowadays. There's problems with these things in the sense that uh, big networks respond weirdly to noise. Humans do much better when you actually sort of perturb these images and so on. So, but, but it gives us a, a sort of a bound on things, right? Uh, uh, you should be able to take your learning alg algorithm and learn something like this, is, is, is sort of the, the notion. Right, so why isn't backprop biologically plausible? Well, this is, this is the chain rule that we use to arrive at backprop. Um, and uh, you learn to uh, arrive at backprop. And um, let me see, sorry. This is, this is sort of what it boils down to. And the issues, there's, there's a bunch of them, and, and people have their pet issue in terms of why these, these algorithms aren't uh, plausible. But I think the big ones for me are probably that you know, you're sending around these error terms through the network, these signed error terms. And you're also using the transpose of downstream weights to adjust earlier weights um, in, in your network. There's also things like you use derivatives of activation functions. Uh, I think another big one is probably this idea of separate forward and backward passes. So there's a bunch of challenges here, but people have started sort of um, creating algorithms that might, not, might knock some of these down. So today I'm gonna talk about some work that we've done where we just said, look, let's pick up the, the, what I would consider maybe the most promising algorithm sitting around where people have said, this is more biologically plausible. We've introduced a couple of constraints. It seems kind of decent. They've run it on some small scale data sets. Now let's see what it actually does at scale. That, that, that's what we're gonna do. And so in particular, we're gonna look at one that doesn't have any weight transport, so it doesn't use weight, uh, weight transposes. 
It doesn't do any weight uh, tying, so that is we're gonna do away with um, the convolutional kernels and just use local connections. Um, and we're gonna do no feedback of signed errors, so instead the only thing we're gonna send around the network are sort of unsigned activities. Um, we're gonna use, uh, now we are gonna use continuous rather than spiking signals. We're gonna vi violate Dale's law all over, all over the place. We're gonna use separate uh, forward and backward passes and local act, act, uh, activation derivatives, and you know, probably your personal complaint here. But, but the idea is, in some sense, do we have anything, right? And, and that's where I, uh, I wanna start. So we've actually started with this algorithm that came out of uh, Yashua's lab called uh, dif uh, Difference Target Prop. I'm gonna give, um, I'm gonna take a moment to sort of motivate this. So historically, this sort of idea, I think, probably came from Jan LeCun. Um, so the idea is very simple, and I'll start with target, target propagation. The idea is that you, you know, do a forward pass through your network, you have a bunch of inverse functions, that you, perfect inverse functions, let's say, to begin with, and at the top, you take the target that you actually wanted, propagate this back down through your network, and then just take local per layer errors and use those errors to drive learning locally at each layer. So very simple in some sense. You can just do a delta, a delta rule at each, at each layer. And in some sense then, when you take that right target and propagate it back down, you're creating targets where, yeah, if you had produced that activity then, and then passed it back up, you would have got the right thing. Um, so very simple. Now there's problems with this, of course. And that's what Dong Hyun, uh, the, the, the fellow in uh, Yashua's lab, um, sort of um, came up against and, and found a solution to. Um, and that, that is that you don't have perfect inverses, of course. Um, but he realized that you could learn these uh, with an autoencoder loss per layer. Um, and that with, those, with, with these things, you could also use, uh, you could also form a correction term for your targets. And with that, you could produce sort of a functional learning algorithm that had all the constraints that I mentioned. So no uh, transposes, no sending of signed, uh, signed errors, et cetera. Okay, now DTP still used uh, gradients to compute the targets at the penultimate layer for reasons that are maybe not so interesting. Um, but the idea is that you, know, you have then two learning rules, which are very simple and layer-wise, one which is updating the forward weights, one which is updating the backward weights using this autoencoder loss. You run this all together, and you have some kind of a deep learning uh, uh, algorithm. We spent a bit of time building and exploring totally gradient-free versions of DTP, where we, we really did learn the last, uh, the sort of penultimate layer inverses as well, and use them to form targets there. And when you do this because of one-hot outputs and things like this, you have to be a bit careful. And, and we explored doing things like augmenting the output layer with random features computed from the penultimate layer activities in order to give you a rich enough target at that output that you could actually learn an inverse coming back. But putting that aside, the real question is what you could do as you scale up to bigger and bigger data sets. Um, these are kind of roughly the experimental details. We looked at a bunch of data sets. We looked at fully connected and locally connected networks. We actually began with relatively small, simple networks where these things probably will perform better than backprop. Um, so these are sort of three fully connected layers or seven fully connected layers in the case of ImageNet. Um, we did a lot of hyperparameter search and we did a lot of human guided exp uh, exploration of architectures because we really don't know how to use these things in some sense yet. Okay, so here's the, the gist of the results. We were able to replicate the original DTP results. We can sort of introduce these weight transport free variants that I talked about that really do away entirely with gradients um, in, in DTP. And they perform a bound as well on things like MNIST. As we go to harder data sets like SVHN and CIFAR 10 though, uh, the gap, especially in the context of locally connected architectures, really starts to widen. So this should actually be uh, flipped around, my apologies. Um, so the gap really starts to widen, so that by the time you hit uh, CIFAR 10, with, a fully connected, with these locally connected architectures, um, backprop is performing significantly, significantly better. And this is, this is tough. These are sort of, what I'm giving you here are, are our best results we've, able, we've been able to achieve using uh, these DTP invariants. Okay, so what happens when you go to ImageNet? And again, I wanna say, uh, really, this was what I considered the most promising 
of the sort of biologically motivated algorithms out there. So in our hands, with a fair bit of messing around, hyperparameter search and so on, this is the picture for a relatively small network. And that is backprop um, for top, top one and top five performance are sitting around here uh, using convolutional or locally connected layers. Um, and DTP and all the variants that we tried are effectively hopeless in this case, just outright hopeless. Um, and so I think <clears throat> this was a bit of a wake up call to me. I think I've been guilty of thinking, okay, we're working on these things and we apply them most of the time in the context of MNIST and small data sets. This was really sort of, uh, this was really, a, yeah, a wake up call to me to say, look, we have to try these things at scale where depth matters uh, and where credit assignment through depth matters. Okay, so I, I, I think I'm actually just gonna wrap up there. The story is a bit simple uh, and negative, but I think it's one that we need to start f like sort of tackling as a community if we think that uh, deep learning algorithms you know, have something to do with the brain. That is, we need to be responsible and say, okay, does, does the algorithm that I'm developing, that where I introduce these biological constraints, does it actually still deliver the performance, which was in some sense the whole point, right? And, and, and that, that I think we're, we're missing a bit. Um, and I, I think I'll wrap up there. Uh, yeah, we have time for one or two quick questions while the next speaker sets up. Um, I, I have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I can ask it well. <laughs> do, um, do you thanks have any, for uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I can ask thanks for the point. talk. Um, so if you, if you want to make this point that we want to maintain the same performance that, let's say, a 20 or 60 layer deep network has, then <coughs> I think... Um, it might be unfair comparison or unfair um, demand to our models because uh, the visual cortex, let's say, has far less layers, but then <coughs> models on top so we can recognize a car maybe um, not only from the image but also from the context. We don't get fooled by adversarial examples as easily. We don't respond to texture as much as these networks, but rather to the real <coughs> objects embedded in the environment. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Why? I, I mean, okay, so, so yes, of course. I mean, there's all sorts of complaints that one can lodge here. I mean, first of all, we're not using like crazy 60-layered six, ResNet blocks. We're talking about like here, this was like a seven, this was like simpler than AlexNet, right? Simpler and smaller than AlexNet. And, and still these, these, again, I no, no disrespect at all meant to, to Donghyun. And I mean, honestly, it was actually the algorithm that I considered like the best one on the table. Um, and, and still it's hopeless. Even in this very reduced sort of prep, we're, we're, we're just not seeing sort of delivery of interesting credit assignment, I mean clearly, uh, to get this thing even off the ground in that kind of an, uh, uh, a network. So there's some real questions about why that's happening. I mean, we don't know, we have some ideas. Anyway, so I think it's, it's about setting sort of really uh, uh, bounds and not expecting that, yeah, we're gonna end up with things that perform as well on like 100 layer ResNets. Yeah. <laughs> Just your opinion about something. Do you think that this implies that perhaps we should kind of give up the idea of backprop and um, adopt some completely different approach like predictive coding? Uh, so, okay, so first of all, very quickly, uh, there's been a cool paper written recently out of Rafal's lab um, which sort of connects uh, predictive coding and backprop. So I, I, I think, I, 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 in short, I would say we should not give up at all on the sort of the sort of idea that backprop gives us, that what you should do is using, use feedback connect connections to deliver detailed information to earlier layers that tell them what to do. But, but as far as what those algorithms look like in between on that spectrum, I think now it's anyone's guess. So, okay, so uh, I guess the last six or seven years in deep learning, the history you might say is that the architectures have actually grown to accommodate SGD. That is to say, ResNet, Highway Connection, LSTM instead of the, uh, vanilla, vanilla RNN, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you, uh, you might think of that as actually a, a biological idea and say, well, you know, maybe we should think of the learning rules and the architectures of the system, the biological system, as being sort of hand in hand. Any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and I, I mean, 
I think obviously when we go out to look for, for sort of what we consider my, more biologically plausible learning rules, we should be looking at architecture simultaneously. So I think, I mean, I would be happy to accept something where someone says, here I've got something that, look, look, if you could get those three constraints that I mentioned and have any algorithm, any architecture that performed decently on ImageNet, I would call that progress. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay. Uh, thank Tim again and we can save the questions for the break.